students were. All right. So for those of you that were here last time or the time before, I don't know. My days blur, and so I don't know who I talk to about what anymore. But what I do at Oak Ridge National Lab is I am an electrochemist, so I study batteries. Uh, and primarily, I study lithium ion batteries. So those are the batteries that are almost in everything. They this, um, more or less rule the market nowadays. Um, so about 100 uh, so years ago, uh, Volta developed the, the actual battery, and it was like a zinc copper battery with some salt water in a sponge. And within uh, about six months after publishing that paper that he reports this on, you had battery piles throughout Europe and in North America. So it was one of the quickest uh, from a scientific discovery to everyone around the world being able to make this and use it and then study it ever. All right, this is, this is like you create the wheel and now you can roll things on as transformative. Most modern technologies are built upon the creation of energy uh, from, or harvesting energy from various resources and storing it and moving around. So you can think of um, back in the old days, you had wood. You go chop wood, and then you would burn it. That's how you would gather energy and then use it. Now we're a little bit more efficient in doing that. Uh, but with efficiency comes inherent complexity. It's easy to imagine cutting a tree down and then setting it afire and then cooking food on it. What's actually happening in a, in a battery? A lot of things have, have to actually happen. So one thing you have to do is you have to make a compound that has internally a different amount of energy held together, holding together you know, atoms and bonds. It's just in a state of a different energy than another material. Okay? And you need it to transform. So you need certain bonds to break, certain bonds to be made. And hopefully, when all is said and done, there's a net energy difference between those two states. And you get energy. You can harvest that. Ideally, it would be nice to reverse that. So the voltage, uh, Volta pile, the copper and zinc, you could get a lot of energy from it. But it was very hard to recharge something like that. In fact, it was easier just to pay uh, a to pay a slave, actually, to polish the disks off and to kind of restack everything by hand. That's how you would recharge it. Uh, you would get someone who was expendable, and you would do this dirty work, and you would get a fresh new battery. Now, obviously, we don't want to do that anymore. And so ever since then, we've we found more and more systems that allow us various levels of recharging. Uh, the best one is, well, lithium ions are the absolute best, but the next greatest one was the lead acid battery. That's the battery in your car. Works. Will crank your car for about five to ten years, depending on, you know, kind of how well that battery was made. I mean, just think about that. You have something that you rely on every time you go into your car and you don't even think about it. It's made once last five to ten years. And when you go and get a new one, they give you that $15 recycling, you know, kind of uh, probate. That's because with very little work, they can fix it. They can make it last five to ten years for the next person. All right? And the way that one works, though, uh, this, this is slightly different. So I, I'm uh, going back to the zinc copper battery. The way all batteries typically work is that you have an anode and a cathode, and you do some sort of reaction on one. Uh, typically for a lead acid or the copper zinc battery, you dissolve one, and on the other side, you plate the other out. So you go from copper metal to copper solution, from zinc solution to zinc metal. All right? And this happens at a particular speed and for a particular energy. 
for lead acid, you would use protons uh, as your traveling medium. So protons are an amazing thing in chemistry in that they're a fundamental particle. So it's just a proton. It's just a fundamental particle. Okay? And we can actually harvest those particles to transfer energy from one electrode to the other electrode. So you're plating out lead or you're dissolving lead, and on the other side, you're putting that acid into graphite, into pencil lead. So a lead acid battery is literally pencil lead and lead lead. All right, and you can make a lead acid battery out of that. And it works very well. It gives you a lot of charge to start your car because protons, they're very small. They move fast. So it's this amazing battery. This battery is slow uh, because if you look at the periodic table there, where is zinc? Zinc is about 30 right there. And copper is about 29. So both of those are about, what is that, 65 times heavier than a proton. So those are going to move much slower than a proton. So if we want to make something as good as a less acid battery, but not as heavy, look at lead. Lead is um, pretty heavy. So it's, uh, it's sitting there at 82. Uh, atomic number, it has a weight of 200. So it's going to move really slow. It's compensated by the fact that the proton moves really, really quickly. Well, if we can get something that's light, like hydrogen or like a proton, but can store the amount of electric charge, like lead, we'd be in business. And that's exactly what a lithium ion battery does. We use graphite, use pencil lead, very cheap carbon material. And lithium is small enough and light enough to where it can go inside of the graphite and be housed there. On the other side, we use rust, a iron oxide or a cobalt oxide. But, you know, iron and cobalt are right next to each other, so they have similar properties. Um, and it goes right into rust. So literally, lithium-ion batteries are made from rust and pencil lead. All right? And we can store a lot of charge in them, and they can power all of our devices. So what one of the things I try to do is actually use math to solve a, a couple problems and also figure out new ways to probe batteries. And one of the ways to do this is Think about your system and turning it into a math problem. Okay, what, what are all the little processes that are going on in, in a battery? So we have a reaction at one electrode. So we can, we can kind of write that down on a, on a sheet. So let's talk about a rust electrode. This is called the cathode. And we have a reaction that happens at it. So an event, OK? So we have an event that happens in time. Uh, so it's kind of a function of time, OK? We have the graphite, which is our anode. So it has another event. E was probably a bad letter to use. But we have another event. Let's call that EA and EC. And this happens in time. But for a lithium ion battery, it's the lithium that's doing all the talking. It's moving from one electrode to the other electrode. Okay. So we need that. That's another event. The actual motion of the ion moving from one side to the other is an event. All right? So we have transport. It's another event as a function of time. So who here has had differential equations? Has anyone had differential equations? 
OK. So you can kind of start to see where, where this is going. OK? So as we start putting all these equations together, we'll have a series of equations as a function of time and possibly energy. And then we have to figure out how they interact with each other. And there's a couple tricks of the trade that you can do to simplify the problem. I'm not going to solve differential equations for you. I'm just saying how they're actually useful in this particular field of science. So what do we do with in electrochemistry? So electrochemistry is really the study of electrons or electricity and chemistry. All right? So we follow chemical reactions by means of where's the electron going. That's all we care about. And the reason why that's all we care about is because that's really all we see. So the instrumentation for electrochemistry is very, very simple. All right? It's two wires. It's the liquid. And you plug those wires in the liquid, and you have a battery, and you have a voltmeter. That's really all you need to do an electrochemical experiment. Maybe some safety goggles, but we, we don't need to worry about that right now. Um, so when you think about what, what we have, we have potential. And what's another thing that we typically measure in, in electricity? So, so you power something with potential, and what else? Current. current, yeah. So current is, we will start to actually build up some, some equations here. So we have current. Current is nothing more than the change of charge versus in time, as it relates to time, OK? So is there, what's a general word for a relation like this, a change in something versus time, or a number of particles versus time? What? Yes, it is the differential, but just in, in general, in general, what, what would you call a change of something versus time? A rate, yes. So we have a rate. We also, if you're talking about particles going through something, what's another word? There's actually two words that would work. They both start with F. Flux or flow. OK? So in, ele uh, in electrochemistry, the current really is a rate of something or is the flux of flow of something. OK? It turns out that it's directly related to rate of reactions. So our current is proportional to the rate of charge. But charge is really the rate of how many electrons are passing through our circuit. Okay? Electrons are what's being produced or consumed during our reaction. So in electrochemistry, not only can we control the amount of energy that we put into the system, but we can directly measure the rate of the reaction. Every other form of measurement is indirect. So if you did this, if you took physical chemistry, if you're if you like, like your labs, um, maybe in second semester where you do kinetics, um, you'll be looking at a spectra, uh, some, some other piece of information, like how much light is being absorbed. And then you follow that as a function of time. Whereas in electrochemistry, what we're actually measuring is the rate. Okay? And this is absolutely powerful when it comes to figuring out mechanisms or what's really happening. Because when you follow the change of this versus time, then you're starting to build up more and more complex mo um, models of what can happen. Okay? So that's a central key component that's unique to electrochemistry is the fact that we follow the rate of the reaction directly. 
So who, who, who has taken like chemistry more than first year chemistry besides her? Anyone else? You, you, you don't know if you took it? You're oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right now, okay. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, for you other uh, non-chemists, God will have mercy on you, but <laughs> it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be work. Um, there's something called the Arrhenius expression or Arrhenius rate laws in chemistry. Okay? So what Arrhenius did was he was the first real uh, physical chemist because he was the first per person to really use exponentials and logarithms in chemistry. And ever since then, the art of physical chemistry has been to look at rates and uh, plot them as a function of exponential uh, equation. And that's basically all I do is, is plot lines. Um, so really what, what the Arrhenius express, uh, expressions are, are simple exponential equations. Okay? It basically says the rate of change is proportional to the exponential of the energy you give it. All right? This should kind of make sense conceptually. If you think of um, gas molecules bouncing around, the more energy you give them, as you raise the temperature, the more they're going to collide with each other and other things. The more chance that there is that something's going to happen. Okay? In order for an event to happen in, electro chem in chemistry, is something has to hit something else. It has to actually interact. And as you increase the temperature, you increase the frequency of contacts or collisions. All right? And so essentially what we have here is we have a rate. So in this case, uh, we call it K or we can call it V. I'm going to call it V. V is some exponential function of the energy that we give it, which is going to be potential, the electric potential. Okay? So we can just do something like that. That little f is some prefactors, and I'm not, I don't even think you go into what that means in physical chemistry. Um, but this is what you get. This is a rate of reaction. Okay? So if we're talking about a reaction that produces electrons, then we can actually do something like this. So in one step, we have a method to where we can control the energy of the system, and we can also measure the current uh, and the rate of re the reaction right there. Okay? And we can follow how this reaction rate changes with time. So this stuff is on a Dropbox, or these slide, slide decks is on the Dropbox. And so I don't know what Deborah and Jason are going to have you guys do. Um, but it, it goes into probably a little bit more detail than what's really necessary. But I just want to give you an idea of really the uses of math, what, what some of us use every day and need to actually know in order to produce better batteries. So when we w go back to this, if we want to optimize our battery, we typically don't want one electrode working harder than the other electrode. Right? That, that seems like that would be a bad idea. All right? And so what you really want is for when you plug or start using a battery, you want the current coming out of one electrode to equal the current that will go into the other electrode. Now, that will happen no matter what. That will happen. But you would rather the potentials not go too big. You would rather, like, if this guy has an easy time producing the current, say he only needs to move about a volt, whereas this guy needs to move about 10 volts, you can imagine probably something bad's going to happen with this electrode. That's too much energy that it's being taken up to use it. Other things are going to happen. The battery's going to explode. 
So what you have to do is you have to, if you measure something with the electrodes or you figure out how much material that you need, you need to kind of balance these two equations somehow, okay? And so kind of the ways that you would do something like this is you would write these as a series of reactions. And you would say, okay, so I have a rate of this reaction, say, or a cathode reaction. I have a rate of anode reaction. So this is going to equal this guy right here, some prefactor, exponential, some F that's associated with this. And then this guy is going to equal this one. And just setting these two guys equal to each other is probably pretty, pretty easy. It's, not, it's a trivial problem. But what if there's a term in here to where the potential is also affected by the current that you apply. So this is where your differential equations actually come, come into, into play. Okay, being able to solve equations like this to where we polarize the battery we get a current out, but the fact that current is coming out loops back in and changes our potential of the battery. So you imagine the way this, this actually works out graphically looks like this. So I'm moving over here. So we have a current and we have a potential. If we have two electrodes that are working independently. They're not talking to each other. You can have one that looks like this, and then you can have one that looks like this. Okay. All right, so the currents have to balance each other. All right, you want to maintain voltage here. So you turn on the battery, you get to that current level. All right, so that's a positive, say, a milliamp. All right, on the other electrode, negative milliamp has to occur. So we go right here. So we started out right there, we've charged, we're good, okay? Now, what if you want more current? Well, this electrode can give you more current, right? So you can, you can go with just a little bit of stepping in potential to the left, you can actually get a lot more current. So that would be like 10 milliamps here. Well, what about this electrode? This electrode will go up here, but that's not the same distance. So it, it's going to keep drifting. And you're going to get what's called a potential runaway. So at this point right here, your battery is going to explode. So how would you stop your battery from exploding? Well, you can stop the battery from exploding by just saying, oh, no, you can't go that. Uh, that much current, or what are some suggestions that you could do? So the shape of that curve is based upon the material. All right, it's just the shape of the curve, the shape. All right. So what can we do to make that shape larger? Huh? We could use a different material. So we could change the shape. So we can get all the electrons that are inside here, and we can kind of pack them in, just like what this guy is doing. We could do that. Billions of dollars a year are spent in trying to do that make different materials. Most of them do not work. What's another thing? What's, what, so think about industry. Industry wants to solve this problem very quickly. 
how would an industrialist solve that problem? Yes, so you can, that's called a control. So you can actually control it, but I actually want that current. So you want, you want that one. I want that. You don't want it to go past it. Yeah, I don't want to go past there. Hmm. It's kind of a trick question, but. Uh, yeah. But just th think of the shape does not change. Yeah. All right? But what could change if the shape does mm -hmm. change? Huh? How would you change the magnitude? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. So, actually, if I, you know, in an actual device, I can play tricks. I can play electronic tricks to, uh, uh, to, to kind of balance things out. I could find a new material. Or what industry does is there's like, you know what, I, I ain't got time for that. What I can do is put five times more material here than over there, all right? So that's useful to an extent, all right? So there's, there's still problems with adding all that stuff up. If you were to do that, you end up with a second problem. The second problem is related here, is that what if there's drift in your potential or your current? What if we have a current here, all right? We're, we're maximizing this thing. Now what if we turn the power level down? Which way is this gonna go? We're at the peak. Which way is it gonna fall? I don't know. So if it falls this way, that's okay. What if it falls that way? We're gonna get different reactions going on, all right? And this, is why lithium ion bat this right here is why lithium ion batteries can catch on fire and explode. They can catch on fire and explode because we can get that lithium to go into, a gr into the graphite, or we can get that lithium to kind of start going on top of the graphite. So if we have graphite, does anyone know what graphite looks like, like molecularly? Yes, so think of like a honeycomb, all right? But instead of like wells going deep inside, just have slices of the honeycomb and then kind of stack them. And that's what, that's what graphite looks like, okay? Um, and so if you turn it sideways, you get what's called galleries. These nice definitive layers. And these galleries, if you measure those, it's almost the exact same size as a lithium ion, as it turns out. You know, it's a kind of a cool thing. All right, so lithium can actually pop into those. All right? Now, lithium would kind of prefer to pop into here, and it can store a lot of energy, a lot of lithium inside of the graphite, and that's why we get this big peak there. It's because a lot of the lithium can be stored there. All right? And the lithium comes in, and an electron goes into the graphite, because graphite's conductive, and kind of hovers over this lithium, okay? Now, if we get too much lithium going in, or we put too much lithium in and we overshoot, we start seeing peaks over here. What those peaks are is lithium, instead of going in, actually just starts going on top of the graphite. So we get lithium there, and then we get another lithium there, then another lithium there, and starts growing, okay? Anyone can guess what that is called? It's dendrites, yeah. So it, you're electroplating, all right? And it's essentially how this battery, this old battery works. You electroplate zinc on one side, and if you want to recharge it, you electroplate copper on the other side. In this case, we're electroplating, so we're storing lithium. It still stores lithium. In fact, it stores lithium more efficiently than having graphite there. But the problem is, is the dendrites. What are dendrites? What do dendrites look like? 
Tree roots, yeah. Metal buildup. Metal build but it's um, like needles. Let's see if I can find a picture here. Um, I don't know what's going to go here. Or wait, everyone has a computer. Look up dendrites. <laughs> look up, look up lead dendrites, and um, and then look up lithium dendrites. So lead dendrites you should see are very pointy. They're needles. All right, and then after you see those and you see that's what the classical picture of a dendrite is. It's this long, thin, skinny column, very sharp and pointy. Now look up lithium dendrites. And you should see it's kind of mossy. It's, it's not really pointy. Okay, So it's globular shape. There's fundamental reasons why those plate differently, but the problem with both kind of lead acid batteries and also lithium ion batteries are the same is that it doesn't plate uniformly. It grows. It grows in these weird ways and it tries to reach the other electrode. Okay? What happens when that deposit reaches the other electrode? Short circuit. Don't do this. But you can look up on YouTube um, what happens if you take a metal wrench and you contact it to your positive and negative terminal of your car battery. You will see some fun stuff, all right? Yeah, don't do it. Other people have done this experiment, so there's no need for you to do it. So you can look out to see what happens, all right? And that's a lead acid battery. That's a battery made out of water. Okay, and it catches fire. So what do you think would happen for, with a battery that's not made out of water? Would really catch on fire, okay? In fact, the solvent that's inside of a lead acid battery is, is high octane fuel, essentially. So this thing, when it burns, it, it burns quite spectacularly. All right, so, that's a lithium ion batteries. As we, as we make these batteries, say, are more and more powerful, uh, having more energy stored in them. As we make them faster, as far as being able to charge and discharge more quickly, this becomes a problem. If we're shooting electrons here, and any kind of overshoot that process, they go into formation of these lithium dendrites. If you, I don't know what kind of journal access you guys have, but I have a paper in um, ACS Nano, and you should be able to ac access the, um, the supporting information for free. So there's a video I have on it um, that is uh, related to the dendrite growth. So we took a electron um, microscope, and we looked at... Let's see if I can kick out out of here. And we looked at the, um, uh, the dendrite growth. Let me show. All right, let's see if I can quickly find this. my publications. All right, here we go. Uh, versions. See if there's the movie in, is in here. Okay. This one. All right, can we darken the lights just quickly? 
All right. All right. So, so this is um, an electron microscope that we have at Oak Ridge. So this is like a $10 million instrument um, that I am putting a highly corrosive electrolyte in that I'm trying to actually make explode. So when you write a proposal to do this experiment, um, you never mention that last part. Um, so you just you say something, oh, I'm curious about the kinetics of some electro winning process and nanotechnology, and they'll give you the time. Um, so anyways, if I hit play here. So these are the lithium deposits. I start growing these globular kind of shapes. And what ends up happening is that when we discharge the battery, when we're actually taking lithium out of the graphite, these shapes don't actually go away. They stay attached to the electrode. So there's kind of some sort of um, non uh, irreversibility when it comes to these dendrites. And so these dendrites, every time you charge and discharge the battery, they keep just building up more and more. So that's taking lithium away from your battery. That's actually doing the charge storage. And it's putting it into essentially a wire that's going to short out your battery. And it's only a matter of time before that happens. And so what I'm curious about, and what I'm working with Jason and Deborah on kind of solving this, a, is wouldn't it be nice if the actual device that's powering or that's being powered by your battery can actually detect whether or not it has dendrites in it? All right, is there kind of a, a clever way that we can use uh, signals, we can use the actual kinetics if we understand how the battery works and we understand these shapes? and how they change with time, and how they change when there's dendrites or foreign objects in the battery, that the device can actually sense that. All right? So this is kind of a signal processing slash chemistry question. Is there something that we can do when, when it's, the device is drawing power, can it sense, oh, there was a little hiccup there? If I go back and look at that hiccup, you're not doing this. The device is doing this. And it goes and it probes that hiccup. Is there a dendrite there? And if there is, I need to tell the user, hey, you may want to uh, stop what you're doing and change, change this battery out. That would be a cool thing to have, all right? So the, those hoverboard things that kids are running each other over with and also blowing up while they're on it, we can, we, can, we can save them. Although, you may not want to because if you have a hoverboard, that's kind of weird. Or uh, the, the vape pens, you know, it's like they're also blow, blowing up. Well, people shouldn't die. Uh, I mean, but if, there's other things that, that, we can, that we can do that are a little bit more interesting than, than those things. It'd be cars. So right now, if you have an electric vehicle like a Tesla, uh, the ultra-charged stations of Teslas will recharge safely your car in an hour. How do you recharge your, your car now? How long does it take to recharge your car now? So your gasoline car. About two minutes, right? So how are batteries going to compete with that? All right, so, so to charge your battery, that's why there's uh, uh, car battery stations at malls, at places that you're going to be probably more than an hour. Cracker Barrel, all the Cracker Barrels have the uh, charging stations because you're about, between waiting, eating, paying, you're about in a Cracker Barrel for 45 to an hour. So your car will be near fully charged there. It's a great place. But if you're moving around a lot or you're going cross country, you, you don't have time stopping every few hours for an hour to go to the place. So that's the biggest hurdle with uh, electric power cars, okay? But, and the reason why we can't solve that problem is because of this. It's because we can't balance the rates. We can't do this quite yet. 
We can be clever and put more and more material in. But as we put more and more material in, it gets heavier. It kind of defeats the whole purpose. It gets more dangerous in case something does go wrong. So what this project kind of is about is I, I've taken some measurements of um, a simple electrical circuit. We can turn the lights back on, Jason. Um, I'm taking some measurements on a simple electric, um, electrical circuit that more or less, what did I do with the marker? That more or less simulates this right here, okay? Um, I've simplified the problem to where we don't have humps because humps are complicated mathematically. Uh, and so essentially what we end up having is something that looks like this. So in the Dropbox file that Jason will show you guys. We have a process that looks like this. You can see that this is essentially our um, rate expression right here. So here we have, as we put in uh, energy, it's going to go up exponential, and the other electrode is going to go down exponentially. Okay? So there's a simple problem here. What we're going to do is we're going to put in electrical signals into this guy to monitor it, okay? And we're going to try to figure out if there's a relationship between the, the pulses, the electrical signal that we put in, and the current that we get out, the rates that we get out, okay? So s typically, if you're charging this thing very slowly, back and forth really slowly, it's like taking a derivative. So we kind of move the potential really slowly between this and that point. If you zoom in on it, so we're zooming in, it looks like a straight line, right? That's kind of what a derivative is or tangent is, okay? But this is not going to give us any information for in the future of if there's a hump going on there. We would like information that there's a hump or that we did something wrong, all right? And so the way we're going to do this is expand that window. So instead of putting in a little signal to go back and forth and basically measure the derivative, we're going to put in a large signal, like that. Okay. And when we put in a large signal like that, if there's any sort of change, so if this guy looks like this versus, let's say, you, you put in different numbers and it looks like that, this large signal would be able to sense that. Okay. So my hypothesis in this project is that this sort of subtlety, subtlety between, or difference between having a small little pulse, potential pulse, versus a large potential pulse, when you do a comparison between that, any sort of difference is going to be indica indicative of a new event or a new process or a different process. And maybe if you do this in a real battery or device, you will be able to kind of probe, probe it with a small little signal, probe it with a large signal every once in a while during charging or discharging. And if that difference between the two become great enough, it will be like, hey, you're starting to form some dendrites. Stop. Change the battery. Yes, I, it says 90% health, but it's going to blow up all that 90% of energy is going to blow up, all right? So that's, that's basically the, pro the project that, that, we're, that we're looking at. Any general questions? So, last year, you gave us a lot of really big data files. Yes. And I still don't fully understand what exactly you did to get this. Right. So I, uh, what I did was I built an instrument to put in the signal. So let me, let's, uh, let me kick out of this and let's look at some data. So I just spent about an hour with uh, Jason or Dr. Um, Jason. 
just to let you know, if you do continue to pursue your education and become a doctor, we don't refer to each other as doctors, except sarcastically. <laughs> um, and if you work at a national lab or industry, if you introduce yourself as a doctor, that's immediately you will not have any friends. So, so you don't do that. Uh, Yes, <laughs> which is funny. So there's, um, if you go to actual uh, scientific conferences um, and you know who's from a government lab and who's from industry and who's from academia, because when someone is introduced, if they're academic, they say, hey, my name is Dr. Robert Sachi. You will hear snickers throughout the audience. And that is us laughing at them for being insecure about Life, I guess. It felt so weird to have people call me doctor because I came from a place where we didn't, they actually didn't refer to each other as doctors. Yeah. It was much more like that. And I actually asked Mr. Griffith at the time, can I please just let my students call me Deborah? He said, Do you want to get fired in school? Yes, so differences. All right. <laughs> okay, so I, I wrote this uh, little thing, uh, this uh, document here. So it's in stages. Uh, feel free to communicate to Jason or uh, Deborah, uh, depending on like any questions and stuff, but it starts to explain kind of how things are measured. Okay, so for the data set that's simple for, for you guys to look at, um, it's really a circuit. It's an electrical circuit. Is that? Okay, yes, it is showing. Okay. It's a poorly drawn circuit. I did this literally five minutes uh, and I couldn't find the file that is nicer. But the, uh, 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 the uh, triangular lines, uh, the, uh, the sawtooth lines, they're uh, resistors. Uh, the thing that looks like a parallel plate is a capacitor, and these guys are called diodes. Okay? Uh, the reason why there are two is just the way a diode works. It allows current to go in one direction. Okay? So if you put in two back one opposite of the other, you get current going positive and then current going negative. All right? that's, the, uh, that's the only, only difference here. But this is a circuit, so I built up the circuit, and this sh should, if everything is right, uh, be that. It should look like that. So if you were to plot the potential versus current that you get out, it should look like that. All right. But notice that it grows exponentially, so it's nonlinear. So it, it, it's not just like a resistor is not ohmic. So you should be able to see differences between having a small signal versus a, a large signal. So how this was measured is that I have a little box that I made that uh, puts in some, uh, makes a, a waveform. Uh, a waveform uh, in physics terms is a typically a periodic thing that houses your signal. Uh, or that you're giving to, you're either giving the system or measuring from the system. Okay. So in this case, the waveform is built up of many sine waves. So I have a sine wave like that, I have a sine wave like that, and the box adds all these sine waves together. Okay. And when it adds all these sine waves together, what I end up getting is something that looks messy like that. Okay? So people have done Fourier transforms? Okay. So you did it. So Fourier transforms allow you to do what? Why, why do you use Fourier transforms? Yeah. So you see something like this. You either analytically can do this if you know 
uh, something about, about it, or you can do it numerically. Okay? Um, and so what you end up doing in real data, we use numerical methods, uh, processing methods, because we don't, this is not a smooth curve. This is built up of distinct and discrete points. But if you were to just blindly Fourier transform this, you'll end up with some representations of a number of sine waves with different frequencies, phase shifts that compose this, this wave. Now, real data is slightly different than analytical uh, information because you have something called resolution. And resolution is very important. So it basically tells you how much information can you extract from this curve, all right? So how fine are the data points, essentially? So Fourier transform is actually really powerful because it maintains a lot of information as you become less and less resolved, okay? So if I deleted some of these points, visually you can kind of, because you knew where these were, you can kind of see that the shape more or less is retained, okay? In fact, if you Fourier transform this versus the previous thing, you would get more or less the exact same numbers. Maybe a percent or two error, but from an information point of view, Fourier transforms are used to, um, uh, as a different way to order information. So across space, across time, you can actually, every single one of the, these data points houses information about all the different sine waves. It's just a weird, cool thing that I like about Fourier transforms. But essentially, this is what you're going to do with the data, all right? So you'll get this mass. It'll look like noise when you plot it. And you'll Fourier transform it to actually get a plot that may or may not resemble something interesting. Um, so the way this is done, I'm trying to bring it back up the computer, is listed here in some sort of encrypted message. So the stuff on the right is what I put, uh, put in to kind of help you. The stuff on the left is actually the data that you'll see. Most of this information is not very useful. Um, this uh, line right here just tells me uh, the window. Like I'm only looking at between one and positive one and minus one volts, or I'm looking at five, a five volt window. So it's not nothing to concern uh, concern you. This line right here actually starts to house some information. So the way this box works is that it synthesizes. So it takes some mathematical inputs that I put it in, all these sine waves. It synthesizes that signal into something real. And then it applies it to the battery or applies it to the circuit. Okay? And then it measures everything. So it measures the potential that I applied to it. And it also measures the current. That I I apply to it, okay? And it does that through a timing window. So I have all these little points in here, okay? And so every time the clock inside of the instrument ticks, it takes a measurement, okay? And so the clock is literally a clock that you would have in your watch, okay? It's a vibrating oscillator. And every time it ticks over, it takes a measurement of some sort. Okay. So what these numbers is, um, start to represent is some information about how it's acquiring the data and how it's sending the signal to the, to the system. Um, there's some factors here, like um, in this line right here, I, ha I tell you what the sweep rate, what the rate of change of this curve is going to be. Um, that's not that important. Um, the electrode area, there's no electrode area, so that's not important. 
um, the current measuring resistor is important. So whenever you measure something um, electrically, you're really always measuring a potential. All right? So that's kind of a hidden secret about electricity is that we're really good at measuring potentials. It's hard to directly measure a current. The way you measure a potential is you have a resistor and you measure the potential across that resistor. And then that tells you something about the current. Okay? And so that's essentially what, what I have here, is that this value is the value of that resistor. So th this allows you to convert the voltage that it reads out into current. Okay? And I'll tell you where the, where the current is later. Okay? So you can just use Ohm's law to convert um, potential into current. This guy right here is a voltage divider. So it's a prefactor to let me set the voltages right. When you actually use a measuring device, you have some resolution problem. Okay? And a resolution problem is you have a window, and you have resolved discrete points within that window. Okay? Those discrete points, the spacing between those points, is always physically the same, but numerically different. What that means is that, let's say I have a 10 volt window. Bam, bam. All right? I have 10 points along that there. That means that each discrete location is, is one volt away from, from the other. Okay? If I now change that 10 volt window to a one volt window, bam. You see, that size did not change. Now I have 10 points between them. So that means that my resolution is now 0.1 volts. Okay? So if you want really good resolution, you need to maximize your signal within that window. All right? It's a technical thing, but it's also very important, and it's the way this instrument has to work. If we're looking at subtle differences between these points, I need to be sure that my window is as close to these boundaries as possible. Otherwise, I'll lose some of this subtle information. Okay? So this is where, you know, kind of digging into the math of Fourier analysis actually come, comes into play. So this is just a number that, we, that we'll um, use to, to get out the correct voltage. I told Jason that uh, this would be a cool, uh, cool thing to try to figure out what these numbers mean right here. So these numbers, you have a question? Okay. Uh, these numbers are related to the resolution of, of, the, of the instrument, okay? So there, some of these are related to others. So this guy is related to that guy. Power yes. It's, it's 2 to the power of 15 gives you that number. 3 if you multiply this number by three, you get that number. And so what these numbers tell you is something about that clocking frequency and data analysis, okay? So what this is is that I want to have 15 bits of information in that Fourier. So that right there tells me that defines this window between the different points, all right? And what ends up happening is that it, after, since I say I want 15 points or 15 bits of information, that means that I need every time a sign, the, uh, the sine wave goes to completion, I need to have 32,000, about 32,000 points measurements in that time. If I don't have that, then I can't do this experiment. All right? What that three means is that typically you don't, you can introduce bias and error if you measure something routinely, okay? So if you measure a periodic function periodically, if there's a noise, a vibration that's happening, it will introduce some error in some of those frequencies. And there's no way for you to know that when you analyze the data. So what that three tells me to do is that 
when I measure, click, the, the, the clock will click two more times and not measure anything. And then it'll measure again. All right, so it kind of builds in some sort of random measurement generator into the co data collection algorithm. And that's where you get this number right here. So that's how many times the clock has to tick for me to measure that many points within my signal, okay? Highly technical, but this is how the measurement works. Uh, this number right here that I highlighted is actually the only thing that you need to know, and that is what the minimum frequency is. So this right here defines what a period is. So this is one hertz, so a period would be one second. So the, the fastest that we can analyze this data, or we can break up the data, is by units of one second, or increments of one second. All right, this guy is the frequency multiplier. Essentially what this means is these are the frequencies that we're putting in. So you'll have two data files, uh, two types of data files. Uh, here you'll have the ones that are in this nonlinear probe or that are called harmonic diodes. Those only have these three uh, frequencies, so very simple. This is our large signal, okay? So these are few frequencies, but large amplitudes. And then you have one that's called pop waveform. Um, pop is short for pop cure off, and he's the one that developed the waveform. Um, this has 40 frequencies, much smaller amplitude. You're going to compare these. All right, going back. Uh, this next line is a phase shift. So you have a waveform. It's periodic. But each waveform or each sine wave is going to start at a different moment in time or within that waveform. So it either starts at a peak. So starting at a peak would be a, a phase of zero or uh, it'll start at, you know, somewhere in between this, these, okay? And so it just gives you an idea of, of how it's starting. Um, what may be interesting is to see whether or not having different phases actually affects the data and how it may affect the data. So that may be an interesting thing to play around with. Um, this last one is the amplitude in voltage. Not quite in voltage, but there's a little note of how to convert these numbers into voltage. So we have some waves, some, some signals that we're we are applying. All right? The signals are defined by the frequency, the phase, and the amplitude. So three variables inside each one of the signals. And there's multiple signals. All right? So in, in time, it looks like that. Very messy thing. In Fourier space, when you take the Fourier transform, uh, transform of it, it actually looks like this. So, that's how it looks in Fourier space. So, in Fourier space, this is the amplitude, and this would be the frequency. And you know it's a sine wave because I told you it's a sine wave. So, you know, uh, you get uh, good stuff. Now, in order to get that third component, that phase, things uh, get converted, and I'll just let you know, into something called real and imaginary. And so, basically what that means is that comparing the, amp uh, the ratio between these two guys gives you your phase, essentially. But that's not that important. Phase is not that important. The actual data. So we move on to the data. This is a measurement in time. So our first unit is, uh, our first number is time. Uh, it's in seconds. I told you that voltage is always measured as a, or that current is always measured as a voltage. And that is this number right here. So 
one of the first things you probably ought to do is convert this number into a current. And you do it by dividing it by that number. Okay. Second number is the AC voltage. It's our signal that we're applying. This guy right there. And the th and the last the last number is the DC voltage. It's the offset that we have. And so basically, what what's going on is we have that curve. So erasing this guy, we have that curve. As this is going on, as we're moving our signal up, we're also slowly scanning here. So we're moving back and forth along this curve very slowly, all right? And we're probing those signals. So that's what that DC voltage is telling you, is kind of where you're at in that curve, okay? And uh, that's about it um, as far as that question. That was a good question, and I was prepared to answer that one. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Like that. It's not like, it's not really like a battery. Well, it is like a battery. It simulates a battery. Okay. It's not an actual battery. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't explode at the end of the day question, right? What? It's not exploding at the end of the day question, right? No. Okay, cool. So we are just looking at like a healthy battery like circuit. Yes. No, there should be a difference okay. still. So the difference is uh, essentially what, what's, what you're probing now is just mathematically the difference, more or less the difference between having a small window and a large window on this circuit. This will still look different because that guy is linear and this guy looks exponential. Mm -hmm. So it will still show a difference. Okay, the, the next step or the next iteration would be, all right, I have this versus that. And how does, how does having a big window and small window allow me to see that this is happening versus that's happening? Okay, because you could think that this is a trivial thing in that, oh, well, I can tell that this is happening if I just, just measure it. Just go past it. Just do it. But in a real battery, you can't do that because in order, I just showed you, it's irreversible. Once you do measure that, that battery is no longer good. It's now a, a time bomb. So there are certain things in measurements that are called destructive measurements. Measurements where you can gain some information about this thing in front of you but you can never do anything else with it because it, it's, it's now a different thing, you know? When you do, a, in general chemistry or something, you do a titration, right? Uh, you, you know, take a little analyte, you do it, you fix the pH, you figure out something like the concentration, that's good. Are you going to now give that to someone to, to take as a drug? No, because you contaminated it. It's a different thing. You've destroyed that sample. And that's what would happen here. So we need a non-destructive way to probe an actual battery material through something that amounts to a, a um, fancy electrochemical echo sort of technique. And that's what you do. And that's what I do. Any other questions? Just general questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah.
Right. Uh, well, back, back in, it was the Volts also blew up. So the only ca electric car that we know of that has not spontaneously caught in on fire is the Nissan Leaf. Interesting. Um, so yes, so what, it, it's not that they're getting it wrong. It, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's when you put more material in, and this, this should, uh, I hope I can actually paint this picture. Let's say you're, you're putting in more, um, uh, more dirt, okay, or something that you can see get wet. Paper towel. Let's do, let's do a paper towel. So you have a paper towel, all right, and you have something that's spilt, all right, so a pull. And you, you can have the world's largest paper towel, but if you set it down like this, it's going to take a long time for the water to wick up, right? Versus just having everything compre compressed down to soak up the water, right? At some point, you cannot compress things more than their, their density, right? You, you just can't do that. So if you make an electrode thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker, well, when lithium is coming in, well, then you get into this range where like the lithium can, can go to the other end of the electrode, or if it's too difficult to do that, if it costs too much energy, it could just plate on the surface. And that's the problem with those things. So you can balance, and that's essentially what they, what they do. It's like, oh, well, I need to have the charges balanced, so I'm going to just make up more stuff. Yeah, it'll work. And it will, until it doesn't. Right, uh, because because you're storing a lot of energy in the lithium-ion battery. There's 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 a lot of other reactions that are going on, and when those reactions just take place randomly, then it can slow one process down. And if it slows that process down, then you can start plating dendrites out. So it's a it's a hard problem, and and it happens randomly. So that's, that's kind of the, the difficulty with lithium batteries. It's, it's not that you can't, you can charge your cell phone in two minutes. You can do that. And it'll work fine till it blows up. And when does it blow up? I don't know. Yes, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So something to where it's like, uh, so the device kind of senses. Um, yeah, you got away with that. Cool. All right, we're cool. Oh, nope, nope, you charged too quickly. Game over. And as, as you keep doing that, then you build up a statistical sampling there. Think of the big data type of issue. You have all these people charging their phones differently and this one fails but we detected it and then you can say oh it turns out that this charging protocol if we charge really quickly for two minutes and then slow it down and then really quickly maybe that's that allows us to do something really interesting. But Those are hard problems. Those are difficult things to conceptually figure out yourself without some non-destructive mean to probe what you're doing. What I would do it is, uh, is cut it, so the um, Python algorithm I've given cuts it up into time, time slots, into bins. And each bin is either a period or like four periods. So like if the scan rate is 10 millivolts per second, then it's either you get data every 10 millivolts or 40 millivolts. I can't remember. Um, so, so that's what, what you really want, want to look at. Because right here, 
uh, near zero, it's going to be more linear. The, those exponentials are going to probably be weaker. Um, whereas over here, where that exponential curve really starts to kick off, that's going to be more distinct or more different than uh, a small signal versus a large signal. So that's why you kind of still need to kind of dice it up in time or voltage, applied voltage. Um, one thing I didn't go over, but it's on the PowerPoint, is the formula to, get, to put this data, like after you've done the Fourier transform, and to, to simplify it a little bit further. Um, so this is what the Fourier transform is going to give you. It's like real and imaginary peaks distinct peaks. Um, what, and that, that would be in both potential and current, because we have potential changing and we have current changing. So you kind of get two data sets of, of, um, of real and imaginary. You can collapse those down into one data set of real and imaginary by taking or the ratio. Okay? Uh, it's basically looks something like this. I plus I I think that's it. So if you take whatever the value of the potential, the real part, for, this is per frequency, so separate it out by frequencies. So you take the real, multiply it, uh, of the potential, multiply it by the real of the imaginary. That plus may be a minus. I, I don't know. Uh, and you do the same thing with the, the imaginary of the uh, current and also of the potential divided by the magnitude of the of the current, you end up getting z. Z is called impedance or complex impedance, and this kind of simplifies things. So instead of looking at all all of this, you end up looking if you plot the real here and the imaginary there, you actually end up getting something that looks like this these little semicircles. So these semicircles can uh, look like this. They could go straight up, tail like that. I believe the circuit should, should be simple. So th the circuit that I showed you, it should just be a semicircle. All right, and so what you're looking for is how that semicircle grows or shrinks down and maybe it even distorts. So I think that's kind of what actually happens when you go into large signals. The semicircle will actually kind of skew a little bit. All right? So this is, a, this is the graphical way I use. So I plot things like this, and that, then I can visually see things. And in fact, back in the day before computer graphics and stuff like that, when they measured these things by hand, they would plot them like this and have a, you know, a ruler and an abacus, and they would actually draw these things out and fit data by hand like that. Anything else? Uh, it's because this is kind of a pet project of okay. mine. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, the, it's a very risky thing for me to spend a lot of time doing in that it may not work. And the amount of time I, ha I would have to spend doing this and it not work would basically get me fired. <laughs> not really, but...
So it, it would just it would just require a lot of time um, on my part, and I think it's a it's an interesting applied math kind of problem for students to to tackle because there's a lot in it, and and yeah maybe <laughs> maybe the uh, the the major thing is is that uh, for for me one thing I like doing is uh, talking about electrochemistry. It's a, it's a field of chemistry that no one ever has a class in. There are zero classes in North America on electrochemistry, except at MIT. It's the only place that has it, and it's not good. But <laughs> at least they have it. And so that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, and so it's a, it's a field that um, if you have a formal education in electrochemistry, you go to uh, Canada or to Europe. Um, to have, and I, I wish more chemistry and, uh, and applied math departments had electrochemistry in the curriculum. So that's why I give it to you guys. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs>